Hello and welcome to my presentation titled, Is Age Reversal Possible for Human Being? And my name is Larry and I'm going to be your host narrator for this presentation. So first of all, a little bit about me. I have approximately 20 years worth of university research and training with a doctorate in biological chemistry from the University of Michigan with a focus of cellular biology, biochemistry, neuroscience, and stem cell biology. Uh, it was my work in stem cell biology um, that led me to pose this question uh, that is the title of this presentation. So I, I just want to uh, have a little disclaimer here that this presentation is not intended as a comprehensive scientific disclosure on the topic of age. So going back to the main question, is age reversal possible for human being? Well, that would be pretty outstanding, wouldn't it? So by the cartoon here, you could see what it would be like if we could actually uh, turn back time, so to speak, and have our biological age be reversed. So the age reversal, uh, is age reversal possible for human being? Well, notice that the question is not, is life extension possible? And uh, the question is also, can we not, is it also not, can we change the aging process? However, if the answer is yes to the original question, is age reversal possible for a human being, then that would have a huge impact on the duration and quality of life. So let's be reasonable. This is not exactly what we're talking about here, this particular cartoon. However, this might be a little bit more realistic in regards to um, the topic, this particular uh, graphic. So indeed, recent scientific discoveries are pointing to the possibility that human aging may be reversed by reprogramming the epigenome. So what is the epigenome? Well, the epigenome is the complete description of all of the chemical modifications uh, to DNA and histone proteins that regulate the expression of genes within the genome of an individual. So a common type of epigenetic modification is called DNA methylation. DNA methylation involves attaching small molecules called methyl groups, each consisting of one carbon atom and three hydrogen atoms to segments of DNA. When methyl groups are added to a particular gene, that gene is turned off or silenced and no protein is produced from that gene. So the thing to notice here is that the chemical modifications made to DNA are not permanent and can be subject to change. So what again is the epigenome? Well, the term epigenetics was first coined in 1942 by Conrad Waddington, a British developmental biologist, embryologist, and geneticist at Cambridge University. So these are some of the topics I'd like to uh, go with, over with you today. Um, so the idea that age reversible is possible is really based on several lines of scientific evidence. So the first topic I'd like to take a look at is the sperm and egg reprogramming. Then I wanna take a look at the first cloning experiments and then uh, take a look at transforming somatic cells, um, adult cells into embryonic cells by epigenetic reprogramming done by uh, Yamanaka. And then reprogramming cells just before the point of no return by a group from the Salk Institute, Stanford University and other uh, partnering, partnering global institutions. And then we'll recap uh, uh, and look at future directions or research. So to take a look at this uh, first topic, the sperm and egg reprogram programming, this is the way. So the sperm and egg reprogramming have to do with, uh, there's a lot of preparation uh, that occurs in the development of the sperm during spermatogenesis that prepares it to undergo reprogramming by the egg after fertilization. In other words, the epigenetic status of the sperm of a 30-year-old man is reprogrammed to a youthful baby state by chemical modifications 
provided by the female egg. This makes possible the creation of a new life. This reprogramming also takes place for the mother's DNA in the egg as well. In this way, or this is the way, refers to resetting or reprogramming the zygote nucleus, which is mediated by factors in the oocyte cytoplasm that are at the heart of this mystery of rejuvenation. This process has gone on for eons and is the basis of the continuation of life on this planet. This is a good transition for our next topic. So the first cloning experiments uh, were done by Sir John Gurdon uh, and his frogs. And here, this is an illustration of the first frog that was formed or uh, created by John. It's a uh, Xenopus. And uh, if you notice here in the cartoon, in the upper left, uh, we started with, he started with somatic cells from the intestinal lining of the frog. He took the nucleus out put, and enucleated the uh, eggs of the frog and put those uh, nuclei from the intestines into the egg. And he was able to uh, have that uh, egg develop into an actual frog. And this was a big deal. No one had ever done this before. And this is a picture of uh, Sir John Gurdon. And uh, there's the publication detail here in the lower right hand corner. And this took place back in 1962. And that particular cloning of the first animal, the frog in 62, then led to the first uh, cloning of a sheep named Dolly uh, to be the first mammal cloned. And this was followed by the mouse, cow, goat, pigs, cats, rabbits, horses, rats, dogs, parrots, red deer, and camel. Lots of cloning since then. So this is a picture of Dolly the sheep with her firstborn lamb uh, named Bonnie. And this was done at the Roslyn Institute at the University of Edinburgh in the UK. So the next topic I take a look, would like to take a look at is the transformation of somatic cells, adult cells, into embryonic stem cells by epigenetic reprogramming by Shinra Yamanaka. So he was able to take uh, fibroblast cells, which is nothing, just uh, skin cells, in a, a dish. He added four transcription factors through a retrovirus system, and the cells were um, transformed into these, uh, what he's calling IPS cells, or induced pluripotent stem cells, which very much were very close and resembled embryonic stem cells. And if anybody remembers back in the, um, a late 90s uh, in the turn of the uh, millennia, uh, there was huge ethical controversy around the use of human embryonic stem cells. And this was a game changer since you could take typical normal skin cells from any particular animal and transform them into uh, embryonic stem cells. So that was a big deal. And also uh, just the idea that you could do it, you know, you could reprogram regular somatic, you know, cells of an animal or maybe a human in this case, and he did do it in humans in 2007. He took human uh, fibroblasts and was able to transform them into human embryonic stem cells, which he called induced pluripotent stem cells. And again, this was a big deal, since you could just take regular uh, skin cells from anybody and transform them into uh, embryonic stem cells. And you can even do this with centurions or people that are 100 years old take a sample of their skin, grow the skin or fibroblasts in a dish, add the uh, four uh, transcription factors, which were later labeled as the Yamanaka factors, and you can make stem embryonic stem cells from a person who was 100 years old. That's a big deal. So he was able to get the Nobel Prize in 2012 for the discovery of uh, mature cells, which can be reprogrammed to become young and pluripotent or simply put, simply put uh, just taking old established cells and transform them into very young uh, naive cells. And so again, here's the same a cartoon showing this, and I have a couple of publications down here showing when the, the first time this had happened. And in 2007, I was able to go to Australia to an international stem cell meeting and hear him give his, uh, an international talk about uh, his work with the mouse and you could have heard a pin drop in that uh, meeting. 
because it was a big deal. No one knew this was even possible to be able to take normal age cells and have them be transformed into uh, embryonic stem cells with just four uh, transcription factors. It was incredible. And I was so privileged and happy to be there uh, at that conference at the International Stem Cell um, Consortium that was in Cairns, Australia. And so um, looking uh, back a little bit, both John Gurdon and uh, Shinra Yamanaka were awarded the Nobel Prize <clears throat> in Physiology or Medicine um, in October 8th of uh, 2012. And the award was given for the discovery that mature cells can be reprogrammed to become pluripotent. In other words, they can become anything. Or in simple terms, turning an old established cell and tr transform it into a very young, uh, naive uh, cell ready to take instructions. So this next piece that I want to talk about is uh, reprogramming cells just before the point of no return. And this was done by a group at the Salk Institute, Stanford U and Stanford University and our other partnering global institutions. And this is a conversation about two separate publications. So reprogramming cells just before what we're saying is the point of no return uh, at the Salk Institute and at Stanford, uh, the aging is characterized by a gradual loss of function occurring at the molecular, cellular, tissue, and organismal, organ, organismal level. All of the chromatin levels, uh, aging associated with progressive accumulation of epigenetic errors that lead to uh, digressive gene regulation, stem cell exhaustion, senescence, which is pretty much the loss of self, the cell's power of division and growth, and uh, deregulated cell and tissue homeostasis. So nuclear reprogramming to pluripotency can revert both the age and the identity of any cell uh, of that, an embryo, uh, to that of an embryonic cell. So we want to refer to the previous point of this presentation, the work of uh, John Gurdon and Yamanaka, who started this whole uh, conversation of reprogramming. So a group of scientists recently showed that transient reprogramming using the Yamanaka factors that I introduced earlier can correct age-associated hallmarks and extend the lifespan of a uh, uh, particular uh, model mouse who ages uh, as a disease that causes the mouse uh, to age much faster than the normal mice. For Jared, uh, that's a type of uh, a disease um, model they're using in this situation. And this was done at the Salk Institute by Juan Carlos Monte. And also another group demonstrated that uh, the expression of the Yamanaka factors promoted rapid correction of cellular aging and included the resetting of the epigenetic clock, reduction of inflammatory profile in human, human uh, uh, chondriocytes and a restoration of human muscle stem cells in each case without abolishing um, cellular identity, which is a big deal because if you leave the factors in the dish too long, they can become and start looking uh, and become um, more like uh, pluripotent stem cells. However, just at the point of no return, that's when it seems that these cells can actually begin to uh, cause age reversal in the, in the cells in the dish. And uh, so it's an interesting and um, provocative study. So uh, this is a diagram showing, you know, the uh, younger uh, epigenome of, a, let's say, a baby or a young person. And then through life uh, and in aging, there are certain things that happens to the epigenome that causes a breakdown in the uh, tissue homeostasis and, and um, the youthful uh, and regenerative nature of our uh, organs and muscles. So reprogramming allows the opportunity to take the genome and move it backwards toward a more youthful state, uh, which is uh, outstanding, which uh, was never thought to be possible uh, till uh, Yamanaka's work and Gurdon's work uh, back in six, 
1962, and then Yamanaka's work uh, back in 2006. So if we take a look at this particular situation, it would be awesome and amazing if this were possible, at least at this level of uh, re regeneration. So the idea that age reversal is possible is based on very uh, a number of several lines of scientific evidence. And I just want to recap a little bit. So just to tell you that I, uh, that we did look at the sperm and egg and how it's reprogrammed uh, to have life continue this way for eons. And that the first cloning experiments by Sir John Gurdon and his frogs transforming the somatic cells or adult cells into young baby embryonic stem cells by epigenetic reprogramming and then reprogramming cells just before what we say is the point of no return uh, by the groups of the Salk Institute, Stanford University and other participating global institution. And then to take a look at the few what might, what might be possible is that we may want to take a look back at the egg with this awesome power of reprogramming, unlocking its secrets. Egg extract studies may help us discover molecules can, that can reprogram human cells to a more youthful state. And if this is true, we can begin to screen for uh, those particular uh, molecules that might uh, be involved with uh, age reversal um, of cells.